Well, Niels, I can uh, I, I can understand where you're coming from in relation to that. Brussels seems very distant. The EU can seem very distant, but I think we're increasingly seeing what a powerful force it has on all of our lives, uh, particularly, I suppose, during the pandemic and now in, in relation to how it's dealing with, uh, with the war uh, in, in, in Ukraine. And of course, we had the financial crisis, we had the migration crisis, and, and we saw the influence of, of the EU institutions a lot in all of those. And then you say, well, we didn't vote for the head of the commission, who's possibly the most powerful person in that. But of course, she does come from the biggest uh, political grouping. So there is a sense of legitimacy there, of course. But I should say that things happen, can happen very slowly uh, in, in the EU. Um, in 1979, probably long before you were born, was the first time that there were even direct elections to, to the European Parliament. Uh, that took a long time to uh, arrange and uh, to be decided among the member states, given that the EU itself was formed back in 1957. So there, there, I think they are moving forward. There, there are proposals for a transnational lists at EU election, EU parliamentary election times. There have been proposals before the so-called Spitzenkandidaten uh, process, where people know that if they vote for a particular political party which in turn is affiliated to a political grouping in the eu they're effectively uh, voting for that person but it, it it takes time i often say these things are an evolution not a revolution um the parliament earlier this year did put forward a proposal in relation to having a transnational list so as well as you know um voting for a candidate in your own member state you could vote for a slate of candidates uh, proposed um uh, across all of the member states uh, the council has so far rejected that but all is not lost uh, people are still pushing for this so let's see what happens in the coming years um i think of course accountability and transparency in eu elections is a sort of broad subject but the focus specific specifically on the election um, of the Commission President. I think that this was a really pivotal moment in 2019 when in fact von der Leyen was elected because it was a moment that sort of showed this rupture between the Spitzen candidates and who was actually given the position in the end. Um, so I think this is a pivotal moment for the EU because when you're asking citizens to voice for the, their opinion on the lead candidate, it can be very confusing when that voice is not heard. And we as EU experts know the, the process that led to Parliament and Council appointing von der Leyen, but the average EU citizen might be very confused and it might seem like it kind of came out of thin air. So I, I understand this frustration and I think that Indeed, even at an EU level, there's been a lot of discussion to reform this. Um, for instance, there is discussion, there was a proposal from Parliament in May to have two separate sheets. So one sheet where you would elect your national MEPs and then a completely separate sheet, which would be transnational in nature, where you would see exactly who you're voting for, for this Spitzen candidate or for this lead candidate. And that would be one way um, to have a bit more transnational cooperation and also clarity. And the idea is that if there was a better, so to speak, um, transnational candidates that were able to have all of the criteria that are required to actually become the, the commission president, um, then we wouldn't end up in the situation that we were in 2019. Um, another thing I'll add quickly to that is the idea of actually sort of creating this pan-EU identity. So we all vote on different days, different candidates. There's not always this sense that you're going, even if you're voting for MEPs, that you're going to an EU poll. So also the proposal to really reach out to everyone eligible to vote over 18, to vote on the same day. Those are things that I think will bring this sort of solidarity and hopefully um, avoid having a similar situation to 2019. So Niels, thanks very much for the question. And also, I think your view is shared by many. A um, lot of people after the um, European Parliament elections in 2019 were disappointed to see that none of the so-called Spitzenkandidaten um, that you know ran the elections as potential presidents of the European Commission, none of them got the job. But instead, we, we have uh, von der Leyen, total surprise. <laughs> Um, and I think in order to understand why that happened, it, maybe we should um, unpack a little bit this um, Spitzenkandidaten system. Um, this is a very informal arrangement. I'm not sure, um, uh, you know, the electorate understands this. Um, it's predicated on this um, provision in the Treaty of Lisbon that the European Council will nominate the Commission 
uh, president based on not taking into consideration the results of the European Parliament elections, right? And what does that mean, taking into consideration? We can mean a whole range of things, right? Um, so in 2014, um, these were the first elections to be run on this system. Um, the European political parties made a gamble, essentially. They said, well, each of us are going to nominate a lead candidate, a Spitzenkandidaten, and then we're going to kind of force the hand of the European Council to nominate um, as commission president, the person, um, the Spitzenkandidaten of the, of the party that comes up on top. Um, and they were successful in this gamble the first time around uh, with Jan Claude Juncker and unsuccessful the second time, right? So that's one thing that, that we need to understand. This is not something that is in the treaty. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a gamble. It's an experiment essentially, right? Uh, and I think if you understand it in that light, you also understand why the European Council might not want to give up this, this power that it has, you know, legally and legitimately to nominate, uh, you know, on their own accord, the next president of the, of the European Commission. Uh, by the way, Ursula von der Leyen is a member of the EPP, which is the European political party that came up with the highest numbers of votes in uh, 2019. So um, that's uh, according to the letter of the treaty, let's say. Um, now, there is a lot of speculation of why this has not worked as well in 2019. And of course, part of it is what I've just explained. The European Council is not necessarily going to play along. Uh, but um, also the European political parties were not really truly committed to this. Um, so Niels mentioned um, Manfred Weber. Well, Manfred Weber was um, um, nominated as Pitzen candidate in rather late in, in the process, right? And uh, we've also had uh, parties that nominated uh, multiple Spitzen candidates, like the ALDE nominated seven, <laughs> right? So. So then uh, that's, that's, that obviously adds to the confusion. Um, so I think that while the, I fully agree that the system needs to be reformed and we need more transparency and clarity and accountability when it comes to the European uh, Parliament's elections and how those elections get translated into the people that sit in positions of power. Um, it's the Spitzenkandidat and is probably not, or at least not in its current form. It's not the way to go. Um, because it's, um, it's an empty promise. I think we can say that after 2019, it's really an empty promise. So you either formalize this system and, and be serious about it, or um, you, know, you, you kind of, you, you give it up and at least don't alienate people that would have an expectation like Niels to see the results of, of the EP elections like more directly reflected in the way that the um, European Commission looks like the new college. Yes, it's the two questions are very linked and I actually really liked this question because the first thing I would say to Mariana is congratulations. She's actually already in some ways much better informed than much of the EU public. I think step one is actually having people buy into EU elections as a whole. There was, there was record turnout in 2019 but it was still under 50% in most places. So step one is even saying, I know the MEPs I'm trying to elect. Step two is indeed, you know, it comes back to the understanding of the policy process and making that both accessible to citizens and also interesting. Um, no very or very few working adults are gonna take the time to, you know, do a deep dive into the EU policy process as some sort of a class. So what I think would be important would be for the institutions themselves, as well as civil society, such as the good lobby, ahead of the elections to get people engaged, excited to vote, um, understanding why their vote matters, both at an MEP level and at the sort of um, higher levels, as we were already discussing as, in terms of president of the commission. And then also, I think coming back to the idea of if you're asking someone for their opinion, you want them to feel their opinion is heard. So also breaking down the process of the of the Spitzenkandidat, of these higher level positions, you know, how is the president of parliament elected? How is the commission president elected? And explaining the process. So even if it's not necessarily your first choice, which happens all the time in democracy, you might not get your first choice MEP, but at least you understand the system that led to it. And I think 
one of the biggest challenges, but also one of the real needs we have ahead of the 2024 election is to get people engaged and informed so that on election day, they know what the process is and how their vote will matter. Right. Well, so many answers here, right? Because it's so unclear to so many people. Um, I sometimes joke with my students uh, when I give an introductory course to European politics that we should stop naming everything a council <laughs> or a committee just to be able, but it's, it's, it's half a joke only, right? Because uh, uh, there is a dense kind of um, EU jargon that, that is really accessible only to those people that have some background and, and experience with it and it's uh, alienating to everyone else. To come back to the elections, um, well, I've just explained how the Spitzenkandidaten is, uh, is, is a disappointing experiment. Uh, and its point was really just to, to, to make that link between the vote of citizens and those who sit in positions of power to make it clearer. And it hasn't been successful. Um, throughout, you know, people are not, um, lacking in ideas of how to do this. So there's been um, courageous proposals, let's say it like this, to, for instance, have direct elections for the European um, uh, Commission president. Why not? Uh, on the model of the French presidential elections or the presidential elections in the US, right? Um, and in that way, you give people really a stake to participate in European elections. There is a figurehead, there is a face of the EU. Um, they have real buy-in. Uh, but of course, this, this would necessitate treaty changes. We know that this is not a realistic option at the moment. Um, and it's, it's very hard to really bring for, together the consensus to even open up this debate at the moment. Um, so um, such uh, proposals, while I think that they really kind of cut to the core of the problem, are not, are not feasible. Um, in my view, what I think could be feasible, but again, it's, it's more of a matter of long-term uh, development, uh, not, not something on the short term, but I think um, the development of a true European political party system could be an answer to this. Uh, because um, as your um, people who are watching us probably know, um, the European, when you go to vote for the European Parliament elections, you vote actually uh, on uh, party lists that are put forward by your national political parties, right? Um, so, uh, or if you are like me, um, a Romanian citizen living in the Netherlands, so a citizen of one member state living in another member state permanently, you get to choose whether you would vote for the party lists of your home country or for the party lists of, your, of the country where you are a resident. But it's still a national game, right? This is also why uh, scholars refer to, often refer to European party, uh, European um, parliament elections, sorry, as second order elections, meaning that these national parties discuss and perform national issues when the elections are actually for European positions. So there's a big disconnect here. Now, if we had true po European political parties, right, political parties that are have national branches but are one organization throughout the EU, uh, if we voted on truly transnational, trans-European party lists, maybe that vote would be uh, more meaningful in the sense that it would be clearer how your choice at the ballot translates into, um, yeah, into those who get to sit in positions of power in European um, institutions. And this is not something that necessitates necessarily treaty change, but it is something that that's, yeah, necessitates political will, let's put it like this, to really create those kind of political structures, political parties that we can then, you know, um, um, vote for in a European way, truly European way. So hopefully that's, uh, yeah, that's something that answers the question. We're all feeling the impact of decision making in Brussels, shall we say. Um, we we're feeling the impact on that on our lives. We, we felt it during the pandemic in relation to the, uh, the securing of, of vaccine contracts and how the
pandemic was dealt with. We're feeling it in relation to, to sanctions against Russia, in relation to the Russian-Ukraine uh, war. We felt it during the financial crisis when the EU made a bit of a mess of things, but have since subsequently tried to put to, to, to make reforms. So I think as, as we become even more conscious of the impact that the EU has. We want to be making decisions about who makes those decisions. Uh, we want to be electing the people who are making those uh, those decisions for us. There have been some baby steps in, in, in relation to that. I, I think more is needed to be done. But as I often say, you know, when we talk about the EU, the EU isn't just Brussels. Brussels is also Amsterdam, it's, it's Dublin, it's Stockholm, it's all of the EU member states. And therefore there's a huge responsibility on the legislators, the parliament, civil society, within those member states to discuss these issues and for the parliaments and particularly member state governments to say the EU does this, we do that to explain more about how decisions are made because often it can be quite opaque, uh, it can be hidden, things are done behind closed doors and yet what people don't realise is that their member state governments are involved. I mean every month, every few months when member state ministers come over to debate regulations and so on, which ultimately will directly affect the people back home. But they don't always make it clear about what they're doing, what those negotiations are like um, and, and, and the dealing that's going on. So I think it's very important that decision making at EU level becomes much more transparent and that you in your home place are as aware of what's happening at EU level in the Parliament of the Commission and the Council as you are at home with relation in relation to local authorities, your parliament, your government and so on. The bridge is slowly, slowly, we're, we're, we're sort of managing to sort of sort of bridge that gap. But I think increasingly there will be greater demands like citizens such as yourself, particularly young people, um, for the EU to become a lot more transparent in relation to how it makes decisions that impact on all of our lives. Uh, regulations are made, laws are made in, in, in Europe uh, because the EU is a major player in, in relation to so many industries because when the EU regulates for the EU it effectively regulates for the world. I mean you see that in relation to um, digital technology, to pharmaceuticals, to form financial services and so on. So even though those decisions are made in, in, in Brussels their impact is felt globally. So obviously, if you're a big corporation and you know the EU is going to do something that's going to impact on your profits, shall we say, uh, on the way you do your work, you're going to try and influence that and you're going to hire lobbyists or you're going to send your own people over to try and influence the various decision makers. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the EU has to know what impact the regulations that they are uh, putting forward, what impact they're going to have on individual citizens, on families, on businesses and civil society and so on. But what's important is that people know who is influencing uh, the play. So therefore lobbying needs to be made as transparent as possible. We need to know who's lobbying. We need to know what are they lobbying for. We need to know what outcome they have. And also we need to know, you know how much money are they spending to, to do this. And I think there's an issue as well. And I think particularly when it comes to civil society and the environment, climate change as well. I mean, obviously, the measures that the EU wants to put in place to mitigate the worst potential impact of the climate crisis will have an impact on certain industries. I mean, we know that. But therefore, it's very important uh, that people who are most concerned about the impact that these uh, regulations may have, or the impact that not making these regulations will have, that their voices are heard, and that is not just big industry. Uh, and therefore, lobbying needs to be made more transparent. And I think the EU administration itself needs to become more aware, more conscious of the very many ways in which uh, people can lobby. It's not just knocking on somebody's door and saying, can I talk to you about this? It's all sorts of ways in which um, lobbying can, uh, can have an imp impact and can influence the play. Because when the Commission makes a proposal, Sometimes it comes out very differently when the council and the parliament have had their say, sometimes for positive reasons, but sometimes because industry or whoever, other players, lobbyists have managed to, to water down or to dilute uh, the intended impact of what, what the commission was putting forward in the first place. Um, it's hard to say whether he's right or wrong. And I think that's actually the problem. Um, so when it comes to lobbying, we, um, even people who you know, concern themselves to do research on these topics uh, don't don't really know the answer to this question. Uh, it's very difficult to understand what the real influence of lobbying is um, because the system is so intransparent, even though there have been some advances uh, in the past decades. And, and we now know we now have this transparency register where interest representatives do um, um, 
you know, sort of declare themselves as actors that are act, that are lobbying on the on the Brussels scene. Um, um, that's really only a little bit of uh, of information, <laughs> a, a drop in the bucket, so to say. We we still don't know exactly, you know, how they lobby. Um, whom really they lobby to, to what results and so on. So there's this really um, lack, of, lack of information. And of course, when you don't know something, uh, then your assumptions start to creep in. And then you sort of begin to say, well, I think this might be the case, right? And I think this, this is really what is happening uh, when it comes to this question of lobby influence and the, inf the role of interest groups in politics. Um, that, that we, in the absence of information, we also assume that they are quite powerful. And that's not to say that that is not correct, but it's just hard to, to verify. The perception itself is a problem for democratic legitimacy, because then you won't really trust your, you know, your institutions to take decisions in your own interests or for the good of, for the public good, but they will serve these private interests, right, that, that engage in lobbying. Um, I would say two things, maybe more optimistically than, uh, uh, than you know, in my previous answers. Um, one is that um, the European decision-making system, right, uh, just the way that the institutions interact with each other um, is extremely complex. There are so many actors involved. We have to remember um, that the European institutions are, you know, they, they work with each other to create consensus. You have to bring to the table and, and um, um, sort of appease 27 uh, member states, 27 governments, right? Those are the interests that shape decision making first and foremost. So um, in a system that looks for consensus, compromise, give and take, if you are a lobbyist, you cannot ignore that. You will also play by the same rules, which means that you will never get everything you want, no matter how much money or influence you throw at this process, simply because the process itself is not designed to give any one party everything that, want, that it wants. So that's one thing that I think we should remember. And it has to do with the nature of the political system in, in the EU. Uh, the second one is, well, it relates to this question of elections that we've just discussed, right? So um, we only have really the European Parliament elections um, with regarding, you know, the input of citizens to, um, um, to, to the EU, right? Um, the representation and so on. So... Um, Campaign finance is not really a press, as pressing an issue here as it is, for instance, in the US, right? Where you have a range of type, different types of elections um, and where money in politics is a lot more important, a lot, it carries a lot more weight, right? Um, in, in, the, in the European Union, uh, now I'm mentioning money in politics simply because that's one of the strongest tools in the arsenal of interest groups uh, to leverage influence, right? You help this politician win their elections, they're going to look more favorably to you after they're in office, right? Very simple. Um, now, because we just have one <laughs> election in, in the EU to the European Parliament, and I've just talked about how that's not like super important, yeah, second order, we simply do not have the opportunities for interest groups to really leverage a lot of influence through campaign finance, right? Uh, and that keeps the system cleaner than in other um, countries where uh, campaign finance can, can play a higher role in the basically environment. So I think these are just two of the reasons that are off the top of my head why we maybe shouldn't be as worried about the influence of lobbyists and big corporations in policy making in the EU as opposed to, to other countries where the situation is more dire. Yes, of course, this is sort of the, a, a very central question to the good lobby. We work on democratizing lobbying. And what I would say would be 
Of course, there are lobbying influences, which is part of what we're trying to counterbalance through having more citizen voices. But I would I would reassure him that it's not quite as bad as he thinks. Um, in fact, of course, there are many, many lobbying influences in Europe. But compared to certain member states and definitely compared to other international contexts, for instance, Washington, D.C., there's actually already a lot of transparency mechanisms sort of embedded into the EU, you have a host of resources to get information such as Freedom of Information Act requests. There's a very effective ombudsman. We have open consultations. Um, so it's not quite as bad as you think. That being said, of course, there's this competition of interests, um, notably on certain things which are heating up such as tech. What I would say is that in order to counterbalance this, we need more citizen voices. Um, of course, we need to be regulating lobbying, which comes through things like transparency register, looking at political donations, but we also need more citizens involved because through mechanisms like open consultations, that's really your chance to make your voice heard um, to policymakers. So if there aren't enough citizen voices, they'll be sort of naturally drowned out by these corporate interests. But the more that, that um, policymakers can really see this demand from their constituents, there's actually quite a quite a force building. I think you can see this a lot in some of the environmental packages, um, Fit for 55 as a subset of the European Green Deal. I mean, this was a moment where there were corporations really waving red flags in the air and saying, we hate this. And then there were still pretty robust measures that were passed. Of course, they have to be implemented, but this is a moment where you can see both policymakers and citizens kind of digging their heels in and sort of, you know, pushing back against these things. So it takes vigilance and it takes active citizens to push back against, but it's it's not all doom and gloom and the political leaders really actually do have a lot of, shall I say, choice and mechanisms to decide and weigh the consequences of their particular actions. That the parliament doesn't have the, the right of initiative, it can't itself put forward proposals for regulation, but it certainly has a very, very strong uh, voice in relation to what eventually emerges because the co-legislators on, on a par with each other, the council, which is the member states and the parliament. So when a regulation, a piece of law is proposed by the commission, then the parliament can have a huge impact on that. So even though it, it yes, you're right, technically it lacks that power to put forward its own proposals, it certainly has impact uh, in relation to what, what happens next. I mean, and for many years, decades, the, the parliament didn't have that much power, but the more recent EU treaties have really made it into a much more powerful force. And I think you can see that. I think people are much more conscious of the parliament now. Um, and certainly it has to be taken very seriously. Its views have to be taken very, very seriously. Its views have to be taken as seriously as, as those of the council when it comes to uh, debating and ultimately signing off on new regulations. I think this was another excellent question. Um, and it's something that's very linked to the Conference on the Future of Europe. I think when you go through the, the many recommendations, something that came out quite strongly from almost all of the participants was this desire for yeah a stronger parliament because it is the directly elected branch. It's the most democratic branch. Um, so I think that we, we see this desire and I think the EU firmly understood that. At the same time, there exists this sort of balance of power. So I don't there's not a realistic situation where the parliament is going to be able to completely expand over the council and the commission, but it does come with sort of checks and balances. So there was also sort of in parallel to this desire for the parliament to be stronger, which I think is obviously something that we're, we're paying attention to. Also the desire to, in particular, to revoke the, the sort of unanimity of the council, which comes in parallel. So you have to think about the three institutions and the way they interact as a whole, rather than just saying parliament needs to be stronger. You can take that into account, but also think about the ways, for instance, they interact with the council or the ways that particular mechanisms perhaps don't serve what you would consider the parliament's interest or your own citizen interests and seeing those as sort of an ecosystem. I also would take it one step further and building on the conference of the future of Europe, say we can go even further than parliament and have more direct democracy period. Um, how do we institutionalize citizens panels? How do we look at participatory budgeting? You know, we will continue to have parliament represent it's the people, but we should also be asking ourselves, how can we get directly involved um, in, in parallel? And I think that's a major question that will be continue to be asked as we look at how the recommendations from the conference on the future of Europe are actually implemented, fingers crossed, because we definitely need more citizen participation, both in terms of who they elect, but also in terms of having citizen voices represented in a diverse way. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Uh, but I, I do have some nuances to make here. Um, so um, just to start off, uh, this has been 
the default answer to criticisms of democratic deficits regarding the EU. With each new treaty, we see the European Parliament gaining more powers. And the reason uh, that, that that happens is precisely because it's the only directly elected um, um, body institution of the EU. So it carries this, you know, traditional democratic legitimacy. It is elected. So then we need to give more powers to the elected body to um, um, fix the democratic legitimacy problems of the entire institutional system. So we have to remember, right, that. Uh, back in the days of the European Coal and Steel Community, the Parliament was called the Common Assembly and was not elected. Uh, but what happened was that national parliaments sort of delegated members of the national, you know, of the national legislators were just sitting there and they had this double mandate. And the first elections we have for the European Parliament are in 1979. Um, so giving more powers to the European Parliament would kind of be very consistent with this historic trend. And I think that the Parliament will very much want that, obviously. Um, you know, possibly um, the obvious answer uh, at the moment would be to just give legislative initiative to the European Parliament so that they can behave like a normal Parliament <laughs> rather than, uh, you know, this hobbles the Parliament quite a bit. Um, its inability to propose uh, legislation in the EU. But having said all this, we also have to look at the legitimacy of the parliament itself beyond this question of being directly elected, right? So that's one thing. But elections happen once every five years. What happens in between these elections? And here, I think we can find ways to maybe, you know, also um, question whether the parliament has truly fulfilled this promise of being the, you know, truly representative of the voices and the options of uh, European citizens. Um, and I want to give two examples and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. So well, my first issue here is, if we really think back to the elections of 2014, those were the elections where for the first time, we see a very high number of Eurosceptic candidates being elected to the European Parliament. Uh, and this was at the time, and still I think today, you can find many voices really describing this as a catastrophe, right? So it's so terrible that these Eurosceptic, um, um, you know, uh, members uh, of the European Parliament now are there, they are able to form their own political groups and so on. Um, and within the Parliament, there has really been a concerted action uh, you know, from, from other MEPs to, to freeze these people out, not give them any uh, reports, not give them any, you know, positions of any kind of influence. But if we really think that the parliament should represent European citizens, there are many European citizens that are Eurosceptic. That's just the reality, right? So it's normal that, that their representatives should be in the parliament and that they should engage normally within the parliament, right? Um, and just the tone of this discussion really reflects, I think, a misunderstanding perhaps of, of what the parliament is supposed to do, you know, in terms of representativeness. Uh, there should be many voices there because there are many different political views and options uh, among um, European citizens. And, we sh and, 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 you know, uh, Euroscepticism is here and it's here to stay. We should engage with it in a serious way rather than demonize it and say, well, I mean, these people are just, <laughs> right? So that's one thing, right? And I think that that's a failure actually of, of the European Parliament, um, uh, how it's, it's sort of reacted to the fact that Eurosceptic MEPs were now uh, in the ranks. And the second thing, and this is maybe more important, is that the Parliament is not, internally transparent or as transparent as it could be when it comes to its you know, legislative function. Uh, we know nowadays that most of the legislation in the EU um, is adopted in the first reading of the ordinary legislative procedure. And the reason for that is that a lot of this uh, uh, legislation is pre-cooked, right? In a system of trialogues, which are informal meetings between 
representatives of the Commission, Parliament, and, uh, and Council to find early agreement on these legislative drafts. Um, this means, on the one hand, that the decision-making process is more efficient and effective because the decisions, you know, consensus is, is reached earlier and the legislative bodies get to do what they're supposed to do, but it comes at the, at the cost of transparency, right? Including internally within the European Parliament, uh, where, well, if you're going to send representatives to, 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 to negotiate legislation in the trilogue system, you're not going to really um, debate that legislation on the floor, in the plenary. Uh, you're going to lock people out simply because there's not room for everyone to participate in the trilogues, right? And um, I understand why the parliament wants to play this game because it wants to be an effective legislator. But at the same time, uh, it's, it's undoubtedly comes at the cost of transparency and accountability, right? Of in, including of individual MEPs. Um, so I would say before we... Um, um, give more powers to the European Parliament, we should also ask ourselves how the Parliament has really performed as this champion of democratic representativeness in uh, among European institutions. Um, and maybe uh, there's there's work to do there as well. So I think it's, it's not either or necessarily, more powers can be given, but I think uh, it's not, uh, we should also look to the Parliament um, as, um, yeah, um, to understand better its, its performance as a democratic actor.